chosen to to be with me at this moment in time because there are some magnificent uh sessions that are being uh you know delivered right now alongside me and i'd love to be in them <laughs> so uh, i truly appreciate you joining me uh today um and i hope that you get something from what it is i'm about to uh present and share with you so what i'm going to do um is share my screen so that we can get into uh the presentation make sure that i share the sound um yeah okay um, so let me know if there's, there are any issues. Right, can everybody see my screen? Let's, let's confirm for me if you can see the presentation. And I'll go in. Yeah, I see it. Good, good, good. Thank you very much. Okay, so Messiah and the Black Arts Revolution. This is going to take place in two parts. The first part is going to deal with a history of the UNIA and its impact upon uh, the artistic expressions of African people. Uh, and then we are going to engage in a bit of an analysis and a projection, so analysis of the present and a projection towards the future in terms of developing revolutionary uh, black art. Okay, so we've got a short space of time, so I'm going to get right into it. Um, I'm going to move relatively quickly, so I hope ones and ones can keep up, uh, but do bear in mind that there will be a QA. and a um, And so, um, yeah you know um yeah any any anything that i don't address or skip over too quickly please uh, bring me back to it in the q a and i'll be most glad uh, to to deal with it all right now let me go back it's not allowing me to go back so let me escape bear with me kings and queens need to just go back a slide all right okay so I want to start with this quote from a mama by the name of Claudia Jones. For those who may not be aware, Claudia Jones is an African woman activist uh, who was um, around in the 50s and 60s. She actually has a, a history of activism um, in uh, Trinidad, where she was born, in the United States of America and in London, UK, where, um, I, am where I currently reside and was born and raised. She is also known as the mother of Notting Hill Carnival. Um, the, the Notting Hill Carnival um, is the largest uh, carnival in Europe. And if you know anything about carnival, you know uh, that, or carnival masquerade traditions, you know that uh, they have deep roots here yeah, in terms of the cultures that Africans brought from the continent to the diaspora. Um, but many people don't know that uh, Notting Hill Carnival, because they promote it today as London's or Europe's biggest, largest street parade, yeah? Um, the history of Notting Hill Carnival is this. Uh, in, the 19, uh, in 1958, uh, a group of white youths began going through Notting Hill, which was at that time uh, a, 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 an area of West London that had a strong presence of African community. Yeah, um, And they began ransacking the homes and attacking the persons of African men, women and children for, the, for a period of around two weeks. Yes, And as they did this, um, uh, the police could not solve the problem and would not solve the problem uh, and in some cases uh, exacerbated the problem and um, the African men in particular but the women as well began to pick up arms to defend themselves. Africans from Brixton which is in South London traveled to all West London um, uh, to defend you know uh, the thing as, as we would say yeah and um, as a result white men were arrested for offenses like grievous bodily harm and them kind of things there. But also black men were arrested for things like possession of an offensive weapon, yeah? Um, and so um, as a result, um, the activist mama Claudia Jones called the first quote unquote Caribbean carnival in London. It was held in King's Cross and the theme for the carnival was a people's art is the genesis of their freedom. Once again, a people's art is the genesis of their freedom. Proceeds from the event went towards paying for the legal fees of those brothers and sisters who had been arrested and charged uh, with criminal offenses as a result of the Notting Hill quote unquote race riots, which is how they refer to it, which was basically a, a, you know, an act of terrorism by white youths um, and black uh, families protecting themselves. Okay, And so we emphasize this quote because it sets the foundation for everything that we're going to go into. Um, a people's art is a genesis of their freedom. Art is the, is the area of people activity whereby we are able to project the best of ourselves and our aspirations, yes? And so when we are informed or uh, inspired by our natural and informed will, we would develop art that speaks to this natural and uh, informed will. We are looking around us and we're, we're seeing oppression all around us, but even in that oppression, our imagination sparks 
uh, you know, and we are able to see ourselves as free and liberated and redeemed people and go about the work of uh, bringing that into existence. Uh, and our art is often the first place where we express ourselves uh, in this regard. And so we're going to deal with this period called the Harlem Renaissance, which is approximately um, 1918 to 1935, depending on who you read. Yeah, It is also known as the New Negro Movement. And um, one uh, uh, quote that I've taken out of this edited version of this presentation, by the way, this presentation is about two hours long uh, in, 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 in normal, um, but you know, because of the time we're gonna be abbreviating it, yeah? But this term new Negro, uh, by some estimations, uh, is said to have been either created or popularized by Papa Garvey uh, himself, in the sense of the fact that the Harlem Renaissance is said to be this flowering of self-expression on behalf of African people, affirming who we are, what we are, and what we want to become. And so this idea of the new Negro, discarding the old Negro, that was often spelt with a small case N, and it was reflective of a new consciousness developing among black people, uh, African people, to do for themselves and, and project the best of ourselves uh, during that time, yeah? And so the first influence that Papa Garvey has on uh, the Harlem Renaissance is this idea of the new Negro. However, um, what in histories of the Harlem Renaissance, you will often not find uh, references to Marcus Messiah Garvey in spite of the fact that it was the Garvey movement uh, to a significant degree because it was the number one uh, organization of the black masses during that time and was based in Harlem, New York. Uh, it was really the Garvey movement that gave a lot of the preliminary impetus to um, the, the, um, the, the Harlem Renaissance. And I hope that will become clearer a little bit later on, all right? So a quote from Papa Garvey. The white man has succeeded in subduing the world by forcing everybody to think his way. From his God to his fireside, he has given to the world from his Bible to his, to his yellow newspaper sheet a literature that establishes his right and sovereignty to the, to the disadvantage of the rest of the human race. The white man's propaganda has made him the master of the world and all those who have come in contact with it and accepted it have become his slave, yeah? And, and so bearing in mind, yeah, that at this stage, we're talking about now into the, the 1910s, 1920s, there were many caricatures that were popular in the white world to depict black people, yeah? One of them was Zip Coon. Another was Sambo. Um, another was um, uh, Pickaninnies, yeah? Another was the Gollywog, yeah? Um, and many uh, uh, my brothers and sisters in the United States are very familiar with these caricatures, um, but may not be as aware of the fact that these were global caricatures, yeah? So Gollywog was featured on jam jars in the UK right up until the 1980s. So a lot of our, my, like my grandparents' generation who came during the 40s, 50s, and 60s were subject to the image of the Gollywog, yeah? And were depicted as Gollywogs. And, and, um, and, and Gollywog became a racial epithet, yeah, used uh, against them uh, during that time. And so it was understood that uh, a part of our work at that time was challenging and directing counter propaganda, counter cultural propaganda against these uh, images that African people were being indoctrinated into as a result of the oppression of white supremacy during that era. And so one of the things that the UNIA did was to, to, to paint pictures of black divinity, black angels, black Jesus. Um, and we may not deal with Jesus right about now, but we have to understand the, the, the power of, of, of painting the image of this man that was being worshipped by our people, the first time we would have seen a black image of this most revered figure, yeah? Uh, and these kinds of things, kings and queens. And so we see that the, the artistic expression of, of the UNIA from the very inception was multifaceted, yeah? But one of the major ways that the UNIA impacted the, the Harlem Renaissance and the Black Arts movement of that era was through poetry. And this is because its newspaper, um, the Negro World newspaper, had a poetry section for the majority of its existence. Um, and a number of the, le the leading people that became leading lights in the Harlem Renaissance were actually contributors to the Negro World newspaper, which was printed to the tune of 200,000 copies a week, yes, um, uh, in the 1920s, and had a worldwide readership, yeah? Bear that in mind. 
Okay, so we want to give honor to a man by the name of William H. Ferris, who is the most noted um, editor of the Negro World newspaper and took great care, yes? He was a great lit uh, appreciator of literature, a literary critic, a poet, and a writer. Um, and he took great care in terms of editing the, 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 the poetry page, which was called Poetry for the People. The, 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 the poetry page over the years had contributors from the USA, Canada, Panama, Jamaica, Dominica, Cuba, Barbados, Grenada, Guatemala, Venezuela, Brazil, Sudan, Mexico, Nigeria, Ghana, Belize, Colombia, Liberia, Bermuda, and plus and many, many more. Yeah. So we can see that the, the UNIA now was not just dealing with Africans in any one location. They, they internationalized the creative expression of African people through this propaganda machinery. And so Africans were getting it, not information about other Africans everywhere in the world, but not just in the intellectual, but also in the artistic, okay? And so we're going to give a few examples in a second but, uh, of, uh, of some poetry, but I want to give you some of the titles, yes, of the poetry that was uh, in the Negro World newspaper. Lord, lift our race. A call to race manhood. When Africa awakes, uh, four million strong, Africa is calling. Let the black man cross the sea. Ku Klux Klan beware. Battle him of Ethiopia. The new Negro woman's attitude towards of the white man. I do like that particular title, and maybe we're going to get a little snippet of that one later on. Um, in, the, in the full length version of this presentation, I give a number of examples of this uh, particular sister's poetry, but the most prolific Negro world poet uh, is a woman by the name of Ethel True uh, Dunlop. If my, if my rec recollection of her biography um, is, is, um, is clear at this time, she was first um, a, a member of the UNIA in uh, Detroit and Chicago and then moved out to LA. There's not much that is known about her life. There are no existing or surviving pictures of her, but much of what we know about her is because of the fact that she was such a prolific writer um, in uh, the Negro World newspaper. Um, and um, sorry, poetry writer in the Negro World newspaper. Um, and is by far the most uh, prolific contributor in this regard. So this is an example uh, of her poetry right here. This one is called Black Bards, yeah, Black Bards. And she says, poets who, who are seeking for wreath, if your ancestors are of dark skin descent, consider ere you dip your pen in ink, or to the muse your earnest ear is lent. The obstacles that you will meet ahead, the entrances that will be closed to you, the exits that will furnish no egress, where progress points the bard he must go through. Consider all the stately ships that pass, the frailer bark bound for success's goal, and the worst, the silence which thou must endure until hope droops her weary lagging wing. And jaded thoughts are or all hollow eyes surround thy soul aspiring that had hope to sing. And then, dark bard, if thou canst patient be, if it will not be thy soul distress, while others wear the laurels to confine thine appetite to flavor of success, dip pen in ink and loose the prison thoughts that shall go forth and set a nation free. Burn evil's rubbish piles with virtue's torch, and thou indeed a noble bard shall be. And I love this piece of poetry because what she's really delving into is the fact that when we're talking about engaging in artistic expression on behalf of the fulfillment of race for a self-reliance African nationhood, we understand that the environment in which we currently uh, uh, reside is not conducive to, to, to giving us the rewards for our efforts, but we must persevere. We must endure anyway. Yeah, that's what she's saying here. All right. Uh, and so for the sake of time, we're not going to go into any more of her poetry, but she has many, many uh, poems uh, in the Negro World uh, newspaper. But this is one of my favorites. OK, but again, it sets the theme yeah, for this particular presentation in terms of Messiah and the Black Arts Revolution. And so um, the, the, the Negro World newspaper did not just engage 
in uh, literary expression, but also literary critique. And this was a critique of um, um, Mama Ethel True Dunlop's poetry by uh, a UNIA contributor called, sorry, a Negro World contributor called Marion S. Lakely. Lakey, sorry. And he says, one comes to realize more and more as one reads Miss Dunlop's poems that it will be the women of the race who will lead the race to a higher and more genuinely cultured spiritual plane. Miss Dunlop is a poetess laureate and heroine, of, uh, um, heroine to her race in that she has dared to write for a cause that means everything to the future well-being of her race at a time when that cause is the object of supercilious ridicule and contempt of many of her own people. Thus, to, to a certain extent, sacrificing for the time her chance to win a larger but what could not be other than less altruistic fame, yeah? Now, think about those words, yeah? Um, in particular, at a time when that cause is the object of supercilious ridicule and contempt of many of her own people. Doesn't that speak to where we are at right now, yeah? That the cause for which we fight, yeah, is often ridiculed by our brothers and sisters who look just like us, but cannot, uh, have not been able to, you know, imbibe the vision of a free, liberated and redeemed Africa and all African people. All right. So let's bear that in mind. Yeah. And um, we're going to go forward. Um, I, I, I do want to just, um, um, as an example, I'm, I've taken out the examples of the poem, but um, if you want to hear some of it, we can come back to it. Um, but this brother um, has the, the, the distinction of being the longest, yeah, having the longest ever poem published uh, in the Negro World newspaper. It's called The Sojourner, um, and it's a brother from Ghana, yeah, called Kobina Sechi. Um, um, he, was, uh, a, he, was, he was not born Kobina Sechi. He actually was he's a fancy man who was born with an English name. And he travels to the UK to study um, and returns back and vows never to wear English uh, European clothes again and discards his European name and becomes a playwright. One of his most famous plays is called The Blinkers. Um, and he wrote a poem called The Sojourner about the colonized mindset that he went to the UK with and him re rediscovering himself as an African uh, and them kind of things there. So maybe in the question and answer, if anybody wants to hear a piece of that poem, uh, we'll drop a piece of it, but just note his name uh, and, and look into him, brothers and sisters, yeah? I want to give you a few examples of the poetry of Marcus Mazzaia Garvey himself, because Marcus Mazzaia Garvey was a poet. His most famous poem is called The Tragedy of White Injustice. It is also a very long poem. We're not going to go into that today, but I do want to give you a few examples. Um, and and um, in fact, let me give you an example of of a Marcus Garvey poem, and I'm going to play you a song by a jazz great by the name of um, uh, Leon Weir, yeah? Um, and we're going to get, and you know, you're going to hear uh, how um, when Marcus Mazzai Garvey was writing in the 1920s, uh, a jazz artist in the 1970s, I believe, took his words and uh, put them uh, to song. <laughs> So we're seeing that, but I, I, I realized I misspoke a while ago. I said, I said Leon um, Weir. This is Leon Thomas, not Leon Weir. Leon Weir is another great. 
yeah. Um, you know what I'm saying? Uh, but yeah, kings and queens. So this, um, Robert Leon Thomas took the, the words of M M Marcus Mazai Garvey in this poem and put them uh, to song. So we're just showing a little bit of the influence there. Another one of Marcus Mazai Garvey's poems is called Keep Cool, yeah? Um, and um, and it, this actually became a minor hit. Um, it was recorded um, uh, by a few different people, in fact. Um, and actually, you know, you know, became a minor hit in terms of the number of records so that that were sold independently uh, of uh, this song. But what I actually um, and this was written by Papa Garvey when he was imprisoned, yeah. Um, and um, he wrote this to basically, you know, allay the fears of the brothers and sisters around the world who were um, concerned for him, yeah, uh, and these kinds of things. And 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 but really, what I want to go into, you can read the the, um, the wording right this on. Uh, but the Naya Bingi, the Rastafari movement, yeah, um, took this particular poem um, and evolved it into a Naya Bingi chant. Now, Naya Bingi drumming, yeah, or chanting, um, is um, derived from what is called Kumina tradition, which is a tradition that um, we as Africans who were enslaved in Jamaica brought to um, the island, specifically from the Congo. And so, um, um, I hope you can hear the drum. Yeah, the Kumana drumming is a is a is a you know an energetic beat. Something like that, yeah. So you slow it down and it becomes Naya Bingi drumming. Naya Bingi is the word, is a word associated with a, a warrior tradition of women, yeah, in East Africa, specifically um in and around the Uganda region. And so Naya Bingi becomes the name of the um music, yeah, the, the, the most noted music tradition of the Rastafari movement, all right? And my son's just walked into him because he's heard the drum, <laughs> all right? So, so now, when you get the um, keep cool, yeah, I, I left it there so you can read the words, but then you have this, this Naya Bingi chant which says, keep cool, Babylon, you don't know what you're doing. Keep cool, Babylon, you don't know what you're saying. Keep cool, Babylon, you don't know what you're doing. King Rasta come now soon. Him come with lightning and thunder to clear the way. And the whirlwind come and blow them away. Keep cool. Yeah, so you get the point, yeah? This is actually literally very, very much inspired by Papa Garvey and that phrase, keep cool. And as you can see, the term whirlwind is there. Carl Papa Garvey said, look for me in the whirlwind, look for me in the storm, yeah? So I'm just giving you a few examples of how, uh, the, you know, the, 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 this, these artistic traditions have been passed down uh, a generation. And then finally, in terms of Papa Garvey's poetry, you have one of his most famous poems called The Black Woman. Um, and I've taken a couple stanzas, they're not in order, but I wanted to, um, to highlight these particular stanzas. He says, you are, you in all ages have the attracted, it begins, um, sorry, let me just say the first opening line. It says, black queen of beauty, thou hast given color to the world. That's the most famous line in this particular poem. Yeah, but a few of the other stanzas, it says, you in all ages have attracted the adoring world and caused many a bloody banner to be unfurled. You have sat upon, exhort, sat upon exhorted and lofty eminence to see a world fight your ancient African defense. In your ancient African defense. Today you have been dethroned through the weakness of your men, while in frenzy, those who of your craved your smiles and your hand, those who were all monsters and could not love approach you, okay, could not with love approach you, have insulted your pride and now attacked your virtue. Once more, we shall in Africa fight and conquer for you, restoring the pearly crown that proud Queen Sheba did wear. Um, yeah, it may mean blood, it may mean death, but we shall fight, bearing our banners to victory, men of Africa's might, yeah? And I, I mean, that should speak for itself. He's challenging us as African men to defend uh, our African woman uh, whilst elevating our African uh, woman. And so I want to just make, uh, give that example right there. The UNIA also had a drama club um, and it engaged in dramatic um, exploration. In fact, they were actually going into film uh, at one point because um, they recorded uh, uh, a number of the sessions of the international conventions of that era. Um, and some of those films were broadcast 
at Liberty Halls. And so they were trying to get into to film uh, also. But um, just as a brief note, there were a number of plays that were written by Papa Gavi and other members of the UNIA ACL, one of which is the coronation of the African king. Um, another is uh, the peasant crown prince of Egypt, an African convention, uh, and coming home to Africa. Unfortunately, nobody has been able to unearth copies of the scripts of these plays. It's very weird, but we know they existed because they were, um, a lot of reviews were written on them um, in the Negro World newspaper and even other newspapers like uh, the Chicago Defender and, and, and these kinds of things, kings and queens, all right? But we can give you a breakdown of one um, which was written by a great African by the name of John Edward Bruce, and it's called Which One? Uh, in uh, another one, Bruce, another Bruce creation, Which One, revolved around an, an African UNIA diplomat, uh, Senebundo Ajay. Notice the use of that attempt at African name. Uh, three young ladies were in love with Ajay, one from Martinique, the Anglo from Caribbean and Afro-America. Ajay found himself in the pleasant predicament of having to choose one of these ladies. Some of the action took place in the UNIA offices that Bruce knew so well and against a backdrop of um, the Garveyite colors, red, black, and green. Ajay was eventually able to make up his mind before leaving on an organization trip to Nigeria. He and his bride planned to be married in Liberty Hall in Africa, yeah? And that information for this, you can find in the book, Literary Garveyism, uh, written by the great Baba Tony uh, Martin. So we see that we've got an ordinary story that, that could be any film, but set against the backdrop of an, of an African-centered organization. In fact, government in exile and the work that they were doing. And so this wasn't just a, 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 you know, a, a political thing. There was storyline and that anybody can get involved with, but that the, the, the assumptive background yeah um was the fact that we're, we as african people should be working for the liberation of ourselves in general anyway all right um and to to touch up we're hitting a moving right now um one of the most underappreciated aspects of the Garvey legacy is the extent to which um the black liberation movement of that time and papa Garvey in particular or the Garvey movement in particular fueled the jazz revolution of the 1920s also. So we're going to just um, hail Baba J. Arnold Ford. We're celebrating 100 years of the red, black, green flag. But um, um, point number 40 in the Declaration of Rights of the Negro Peoples of the World um, also designates the, the, the anthem, Ethiopia, the land of our fathers, uh, as the anthem of the African race. And it was written and composed by J. Arnold Ford, who was uh, the... the um, the band leader of the UNIA ACL and had also other leadership traditions. Ethiopia, the land of our fathers, the land where the gods love to be. As storm clouds at night suddenly gathers, our armies come rushing to thee. And that's how people used to try it. But now, nowadays, you know, um, we, we, we try it again with a Naya, Naya Bingi rhythm. Yeah. We must in the fight be victorious when swords are stretched outward to thee. For us will the victory be glorious when led by the red, black, and green. And we can speed up as well. Advance, advance to victory let africa be free advance to meet the foe advance to meet the foe with the might of the red the black and the green with the might of the red the black and the green yeah so that's the anthem for those who have never heard it. Um, you know what I'm saying? But yes, kings and queens, we want to honor Baba J.R. Arnold Ford. This is also the 100th year anniversary of this uh, anthem. Um, right, so I'm going to move very, very quickly. Um, let me just do a little time check so we know when we're there. Oh, wow. I've been speaking for 45 minutes. No, I haven't. Half an hour. Okay, we're going to go on for another um, 15. Yeah, and then we're going to open up for Q&A. Okay, 10, 15 minutes. All right. Um, right, so setting the tone for this now, just not, not just looking at the art, yeah, but the foundation of the art. This is taken from a book um, entitled um, Heat Cool, yeah, um, written by uh, Theodore Vincent, who's a European, 
but um, there's some very useful information in uh, the book. It says, the exposition of these groups and their stand on music comprise the next sections of this book. The decision, sorry, the book is about um, the activisms, the activists that fueled the jazz era, the jazz age. And so he's now presenting his reason for focusing on the Garvey movement first and foremost, yeah? He says, the, the exposition of these groups and their stand on music comprise the next sections of this book. The decision to put the Garvey movement first was dictated by the following deductions. A, support for jazz and blues were weak among the prudish black middle class that included black democratic and Republican politicians, a host of opinionated intellectuals and most academics. B, support was strong among the black working class that brought blues, records and field dance halls. But although this was the sizable black majority, it had little in the way of politicized organization except for the Garvey movement. Therefore, to discern the politicized support at an organizational level among the segment of the black community closest to the pulse of the music revolution, one has to look at the Garvey movement with its composition of factory workers, domestic workers, and others of the laboring classes. Yeah, um, And so um, he goes for a number of different names, but again, the most prolific um, jazz musician associated with the Garvey movement is a woman by the name of Ravella Hughes. If you read any um, you know, generic biographies of her, you generally won't see the UNIA ACL mentioned, but she wasn't a dedicated member. Um, and um, uh, to many estimations, um, would have had a more prolific career in jazz and theater had it not been for her dedication to the Garvey movement. Um, so she headlined a number of UNIA ACL events, including conventions. She was a part, she sang with the UNIA official band uh, and choir uh, and many other things. Yeah, we're not going to go into her too much right now, but just note um, the name and please go forward and do further research on uh, our elder ancestor. Um, right. So also taken from the book, um, Keep Cool, yeah? Um, he says, Garvey was the, was the master organizer of the supposedly unorganizable, the unwanted and the misunderstood of the black working class. This was the class that inspired the socially conscious musicians such as Handy Ellington, which is Duke, I'm sorry, Handy Ellington um, and, and Razaf, which is Andy Razaf. Um, but, uh, by the way, quick note, um, I took it out, but the... Duke Ellington wrote a number of tributes yeah, to uh, people like Denmark Vesey, Nat Turner, um, Toussaint Louverture, and a number of notable African revolutionary warriors, none of which were recorded because um, basically all white people own the studios. White people ain't going to give you money and space um, to, to, to create um, tributes, to record tributes to our great ancestors who fought for our liberation. Yeah, so that's just a, that's a, a case in point. Uh, but the musicians gained their fame um, in the broader arena rather than in the fields, yeah? Um, the mines or the tenements. Similarly, while Doherty and Walton campaigned for quality music at prices tenement dwellers could afford, their fight was still one that reached out beyond the community to deal with businessmen um, and others from white society, yeah? Garvey was different. He sought to construct a separate world funded on the nickels and dimes of the forgotten people of, um, of all the beaten down South Central neighborhoods everywhere. By the mid-1920s, his UNIA had spread not only across the USA, but throughout the Caribbean and parts of Africa. The branches attempted to create an infrastructure for self-sufficiency. Liberty Halls, and music groups, along with many small businesses, organized on principles of economic cooperatives, while others have talked about black self-help on a grand scale, Garvey and his followers pulled it off, at least for the period that coincided with the prime years of the jazz age. So, to explain something, um, you, Liberty Halls on Saturdays and Fridays often acted as dance halls and performance spaces for jazz bands, yeah? And many, it was not unusual, yeah, for parties, yeah? As us as serious organizers, often, you know, go on, let's say we're in a party, but we do party, yeah? Uh, you know what I'm saying? And it was not unusual for the UNIA ACM um, to, 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 to host parties or be the space in which others hired the, the space to hold parties, kings and queens. And so, because um, jazz was and blues was considered the devil's music, um, it, it, found, it found difficulty getting a certain level of profile. But because the UNIA had an organic infrastructure, UNIA Liberty Halls became safe spaces for people to experience uh, the grassroots black music is the point that is being made here across, once again, 
economic cooperative lines. There's a case in point there, Kings of Queens. There's a lesson there. All right. So legacy of the people, just to touch on some names that were inspired. Um, um, you know, we have this flowering of the black arts movement that was global in the 1960s and 70s. These are a number of the, the, the noted names. Um, uh, Abby Lincoln, Max Roach, Fella and Nicola Fakuti, Peter Tosh. Not going to go into too much detail about them today, um, except to say one thing. I have heard a story about Abby, sorry, Max Roach famous jazz drummer and abby lincoln is one of my is if sorry my favorite jazz vocalist of all times yeah um just check out her music but apparently max roach actually went on stage in the middle of a miles davis performance one performance once carrying a sign that said africa for the africans at home and abroad yeah i've never been able to find an image of this particular occurrence uh but i i hope to at some point in the future because apparently he annoyed um 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 Miles Davis, who said basically, yeah, no, nah, he, he, he ain't got no problem with the message, but just not during the music. Uh, you know what I'm saying? Then now you have Nina Simone, uh, James Brown, uh, Miriam McKeeba. James Brown is important because he was not necessarily known to be an, a grassroots activist in the same way that Nina Simone uh, and Mama Miriam McKeeba were. Um, they were on the ground with people, yeah? But the, the, the energy of the movement was so strong at the time that even, you know, our greatest showman of the era had to, you know, project this magnificent blackness and which he was already doing through through the music uh, uh indirectly but then this song called say it loud i'm black and i'm proud um and then mama maria makiba um who married baba kwame to the day after she married him all of her music was taken off the shelf and they had to travel to guinea um whereby they became ambassadors for secretary's revolutionary government um and Pan-Africanism around the world, yeah? And Mama Nina, what, what can we say about Mama Nina Simone? Do you know what I'm saying? Uh, you know, she, 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 she sacrificed a lot, yeah? Um, uh, to, to, to create music that spoke to our people uh, in all facets of our existence. And so we just want to honor these greats. Uh, and finally, just a few of the poetry groups, the last poets and the What's Prophets in particular, because they were um, instrumental in what came later in terms of the development of hip hop. And this year, the, the, seven, the 50th anniversary of this, um, the last poet's first album is also being celebrated. Uh, I'm going to skip this slide for the sake of time. Just want to honor um, Baba uh, Burning Spear, yeah? Because many of my father's generation learned about Marcus Mazaya Garvey through the efforts of the Rastafari movement, whose primary propaganda machinery was reggae music. And Burning Spear wrote a whole album entitled Marcus Garvey. It has a number of songs in tribute to Marcus Mazaya Garvey. Um, and then we want to honor Tupac Shakur, who was a child of the movement uh, and uh, wrote, yeah? Uh, in, in, in terms of the pride of the movement, but also the destruction of the movement. We're not going to read the poetry right now because of time, yeah? But just as a note, Tupac Shakur is not just an artist. He is a child of the movement and a representation of what uh, children who are targeted by the state for being the children of activists have to go through and what can manifest. That's that internal struggle. Yes, that can manifest when you when you want to do this work, but are uh, deeply troubled by the destruction of the movement that, that came around you. And you're going to manifest both of those dynamics, kings and queens. Yeah, the life of Tupac Shakur is worth much more study. So now we get to the modern day whereby popular art depicting black people is a big industry. Yes. And, you know, we here we see two examples yeah, of art that has been celebrated by the African diaspora globally. At the top, you see um, the film Black Panther and uh, the, writer, so the director of the film has said publicly that this particular image was, a, was deliberate in the sense that it depicted the, the black liberation flag, the red, black and green, yes? So the, the Garveyism is featuring in this film yeah. Then now and below, Beyonce recently released uh, Black is King. I'm yet to see it. Yeah. I'm yet to see it. But I have seen Lemonade, the whole breakdown on that also. But we can see that this, these monumental expressions of Africanness and Blackness have become seriously popular and big business. The, 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 the major, and we, there's a lot we can go into in analyzing a lot of this stuff. Yeah. But the major contradiction here is that it's big business, but big business for who? Yeah. Disney is behind both of these projects, yeah? In one way, shape or form. You have also, there's others like Columbia and Marvel Studios and so on and so forth, yeah? So we have to ask ourselves the question, even if we've, we're celebrating uh, uh, the art, even if we're critiquing the art, yeah? And I'm one of those, I critique the art. There's things in it I celebrate and, th and there's things in it I would, um, uh, you know, I would like to flag up for our consideration, for our critique. 
yeah? But the greatest contradiction is that whereas the Gavi movement was developing an independent infrastructure, now the system of white supremacy capitalism is buying off and buying into our artistic expression. What does that represent for the goal of African nationhood? If we understand that art within the UNIA was about forwarding the people's art is the genesis of their freedom. And so the people, the brothers and sisters in the UNIA ACO were projecting what freedom looks like for the African. Yes, if that's what they were doing. What does it say now when we have a, an artistic movement that is really being paid for by the system of white supremacy? Yes. Uh, and do we have, as Pan-African, Garvey and Black nationalists, something to say and do about this that is the question we'll come back to that in the q a i hope yeah a lot of the more popular artistic exp um, expressions out there right about now depicting black people so you have uh, depicted and written by or produced by black people you have um scandal on your left hand side and you have power on your right these are two of the most popular shows within the last decade that you know tear up black twitter and get, got popular on twitter and them kind of things there but when you check it scandal and when you at the end of it is really i'm i'm putting it out there is a black woman's love letter to um to uh the white woman and the system of white supremacy and uh power in when it's all said and done is a black man's love letter to the white woman and the system of white supremacy all right so the, but but these are shows that our people are championing yes and when scandal came out there was a whole debate about um, you know, whether between black, there's a, a, a agenda war going on about the depictions of black men and womanhood, and and, and a lot of the sisters were taking um, uh, 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 Olivia Pope as a symbol of black womanhood, yeah, uh, and and the same goes um, for for power. But both of these people um, and these shows really are not even about the characters; they're about our relationship to the system. Yes, the American system in particular of uh, white supremacy and our allegiance to it because Ghost is aspiration now is, is then to become a politician. Yeah, <laughs> so there, there's a lot I could say about that, Kings of People. We're going to move on, all right? So we have to have other examples. Um, and we have on two examples here in the 70s, in the, in the post-independence, in the, sorry, in the independence and African revolutionary era, a director by the name of Osman Sambeni was creating a number of different films. One of them is Cheddar, uh, which is a film that depicts and uh, goes into uh, an African society that is, is, is dealing with the influx of Islam as well as... Um, the coming of colonization, yeah, from Europe. And then you have um, Sankofa, which is by, by Baba Haile Gedema. Both of these films are independently made. Um, and I'm just putting these here as examples uh, for us uh, to look into because we have the remnants, the, the, the makings of an independent movement that we have to now invest in and fuel uh, and develop uh, further, okay? Um, and so I want to give a few examples of my own work. I'm part of a, a spoken word collective called The Best Kept Secret. We put on a couple of shows. One is called Gangland, where we were dealing with the gang violence issue in our community in this country. Another is called Tugstar for President, whereby one of our members, his name is Tugstar, and he had written a piece, a poetry piece, as though he was a candidate running for a presidency. And so we developed a whole presidential campaign piece, a uh, theatrical piece around it. Um, if I have, um, and, and also, um, uh, I am the creator of, within my role as a uh, youth uh, leader of the al Kebla Revivalist Movement had created in 2006 an event called Messiah Storm, which was a platform for black revolutionary artists. Yeah. And so we, kept, we held that event annually. Haven't had it for the last few years for a number of different reasons. But it was, you know, you can find uh, footage of Messiah Storm online on YouTube, if you so look, particularly on Got Kush TV, um, the media platform of which I am uh, a director. Um, if, if there is time, I will play you a snippet of Talk Star for President, yeah? Um, but the, to, to wrap up, um, um, the question for me is, what do we need to do now? Yeah, coming back to the question about what, how the, the mainstream is buying into and co-opting black artistic expression. But the mainstream will never 
buy into black artistic expression that is fueling a nation building agenda. So what do we as nation building artists have to do in order to develop ourselves? Yeah. And I'm suggesting that two things can go on. One is that we need to be in theater. Yes. Because, I, um, because films, obviously, generally speaking, um, require uh, mass budgets that theater doesn't necessarily require. Yeah. And so we need to invest heavily in theater and we use um the model of um of uh tyler perry yeah um there's a lot we can learn from 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 the model because he started in theater and then developed into something else and the second um is uh, that we need to create a union yeah um of uh pan-african revolutionary artistic expression so that we're linked up they're strengthening the numbers and sometimes internationally we're not as linked as we um should be i'm not going to play the video right about now but if brothers and sisters absolutely want me to play a snippet of this play um i will do so in the q a but i want to give way for q a right now um, um and just read this quote to end this quote to end papa garvey says um, the flag of a nation is its emblem that signifies the existence of that nation. Have your flag. It is red, black, and green. Be proud of it, for it is the emblem of your race. When other nations exhibit theirs, exhibit yours. Make songs about your nation and sing them. Write poetry about your nation and recite it. Glorify your nation in music and in song. Don't sing the songs of other races. Don't recite the poems of other races. See only yourself in everything. Make your nation the highest expression of human idealism then live up to it give thank you for listening brothers and sisters uh, much appreciated and i'm going to conclude there tender uh thank you brother uh shakara um are there any questions from the chat or you can unmute yourself and ask feel free to come through brothers and sisters um you know, whenever I don't get questions, I always feel like I've either displayed, the, the delivered and explained everything masterfully or people are shy. Um, so either way, feel free to come through. I'm, I'm watching the chat as well. Um, but I hope ones and ones got something from that. As, as I said, the actual presentation is about two hours long um, and, I'm going, and I go into a lot of different stuff. Um, but yeah, I, I'm really inspired by this need for us to fortify and develop our nationalist, pan-Africanist, black power arts movement. Um, and so I hope ones and ones have, you know, points on that. Yes, um, greetings, Shakara. My brother. Uh, well, on, King. <laughs> I'm good, I'm good, I'm good. I'm feeling fresh. Uh, greetings, everybody. I hope everyone's well. Um, it might be a good idea for everyone to unmute and for conversation to flow like that even as well. Um, so I just wanted to um, um, speak about, um, well, I had one particular question, but generally I wanted to um, echo the sentiments kind of towards the end of that presentation regarding a union of Pan-African expression. Um, when you said the word union, I was thinking even more along the lines of, um, from a financial perspective to, to be able to, as I've, I've stated to you before in the past, to be able to siphon and trans, tra transport, um, wealth from more developed nations yes. and the artistic practices amongst black people, mm -hmm. um, being that we are paid a little bit better, well, quite significantly more actually. And be able to try to um, get those um, those resources across the pond and into the continent, so we can do more work um, together. Mm -hmm. um, the question I had was it was a kind of a question to myself, really. Um, when you were talking about jazz, you mentioned something. You said um, on a couple of occasions you mentioned that jazz was um, demonized by the black middle class. Um, I think that's what you said, um, which was an interesting um statement given um here in the uk probably the brothers and sisters in in, in um, the united states don't know what the state of play is with regards to jazz um obviously we've inherited off, off of you um but there is an interest in jazz in the uk amongst a lot of the young um young black people um but that seems to be that interest is really coming from the working class of the black community um in, in, in a sense of not, maybe not those who play the, play the instruments mm -hmm. necessarily, although there are organizations like Tomorrow's Warriors who um, provide young people um, who are disadvantaged with access to um, high level um, musicianship. Um, but generally speaking, I mean, I'm probably speaking for myself as I'm probably classed as working class. Um, 
that yeah the interest is amongst me and my friends and them is from from us um so i want i was wondering what inf- i'm trying to word the question properly what influence has has the influence come from the black working class and even the black um the religious beliefs of the black working class mm-hmm. down to the black sorry middle class sorry the black um, middle class and their um spirituality be it whether it's christianity um which would probably be the majority of them um has there been a, 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 an influence from the, the, the middle classes down to the working classes to affect, um, to, to have an effect? I think I've worded it differently, you know. I think I've worded it wrong. But essentially, um, I'm wondering how, how um, you know, that demonization um, has been passed on since those times. How is it, how is it manifested? How is it morphed? How is it transformed? Um, okay, so I'm going I'm to try and answer that as best I can and as briefly as I can. In my humble observation, um, I, it would appear that jazz became uh, a very uh, middle class aspirational type music, yeah, um, um, later on. Um, and uh, other forms of black music were demonized, you know what I'm saying? So we're basically during that, that era, the jazz era, record companies began to buy into jazz as they, you know, the same, um, the same story has you we can tell the same story about various different kinds of black music around the world yeah whether it's salsa whether it's reggae music dance or whatever there's a point at which it's very grassroots and very demonized and then at some point the commercial record industry buys into it um and so it it, it, it develops an air of respectability yeah um that that you know other forms of black music necessarily um don't have um in, in that kind of way yeah um and it takes four but whenever Whenever there is a, a, a strong black sensibility, a strong sense of organic and independent identity among African people, we tend to revive dignity and pride to all of our traditions. So we'll go back and look into jazz. We'll go back and look into blues or mentor or skia uh, or, you know, all the, the various different musics that come or Afrobeat. Yeah. Fela and Nicola Pacuti is very popular right, right about now. <laughs> right. When he wasn't. Uh, a decade or two ago, you just, just what I'm saying, um, mm. in, in, in the same kind of way. And so th- there's a flowering of blackness that, um, that, you know, inspires us to look into these things and develop them more. But oftentimes, because the, the purse strings are still held by the colonizer, the, the benefits are often reaped by them. And then what becomes popular is also decided by them. So er- what is missing is an independent artistic infrastructure. Um, and I hope that answers your question, uh, it, it, plus a little bit more. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll come through maybe later after some other yeah, questions. Thanks. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. Yeah, brother. Go ahead, sister Sharon. Okay, I'd like to add to that, uh, to your question and also discussing the whole issue of the blues. Maybe a lot of you may already know mm-hmm. about uh, Leroy Jones, who, of course, became Amira Baraka. And he wrote this amazing book on blues people um, back in, because I'm a part of that era. So it's like back in the day, um, there was not only, especially I'm saying this for international people too, back in the day, uh, it was not just working class. It was, there was a sense of ownership of people that you had listed up there on in your presentation so i wanted to make sure that we we recognize that during that time our parents were the ones who came out of segregation and they empowered no matter what class you were yes yes they empowered the children to yes. act unified yes and so and that's how that music became such an important part of the movement during the 60s definitely and so there are there's a lot of literature during that time and amiri uh who was just amazing was always giving and you were talking about theater theater is so vital because that's where the energy the, the passion comes from uh, where film disconnects that mm. so that's all i'm gonna say right now Thank you, Mama. Thank you. I, 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 you sound like somebody I, I, I need to connect with more. You sound like you got my, my, you know, my passion for artistic expression. So I love. Yes, to, I'm I a visual and performing artist, and I, and I teach. I teach all over the world, right. uh, because and I'm looking into the communities, not just 
those who have blacks who are poor, mm -hmm. but we have to educate those who consider themselves the wealthy. Uh, they are the ones, so we've got to connect that. And so I do that. Yeah, Thank we you. will connect Shakara. Thank you very much, Mama. Anybody else? I, 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 Shakara, um, can you put your contact information in the chat? Um, yes, sir. Just because we're we're within like four minutes of the the main session starting in that understand. way, yeah. <laughs> Not to cut understand. off anybody, I apologize. No problem. Um, um, yeah. So I'm I'm Shakara speaks on 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 um social media, um on all social media, and I um I'm gonna put my email in there as well. Um, but yeah, anybody else? Oh, so are we taking any more comments, bro? Oh uh, no, yeah. You can you can continue if you yeah, want. Yeah. Um, um, and just a a note to everyone else, you can use the link. Um at 1.30 to return to the main room again, so that way you don't have to go back to your emails and do all that. You yeah, definitely fine. can see the question. Um, by the way, if anybody does want to watch that, the, the, the snippet of, of the, the play talks after president, I'll play, even if, so you can watch it whilst people are going back to the room if you want to, if you actually want to see it, I'll, I'll definitely do that. And we can close after that. But I do um, want to encourage, not just questions, if anybody got a comment or anything to add as well, um, I'd be most glad to receive it. Yeah. I just want to thank you for that powerful presentation. Thank you very much. And uh, I learned something. I didn't, I didn't realize uh, Shape Your Mind to Die. I listened to a lot of Leanne Thomas. I didn't know that was a poem by uh, yes. Honorable Marcus Messiah Garvey. Mm -hmm. And uh, you made a powerful uh, statement in the beginning. I think it's a quote by uh, Garvey. A people's art is a genesis of their freedom. It's, it's actually a, a quote from Claudia Jones, Mama Claudia Jones. Jones. Okay, and I think about uh, rap music and how it was co-opted, you know, from the real positive uh, lyrics to, you know, a lot of gangster stuff that really, because I think that that art form of rap is a part of our liberation because it resonates very well with our young people and our millennials. So we have to regain that. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I appreciate it. I, I want to acknowledge Baba Mossy uh, in the building. Uh, long-standing UNIA activist. I just want to say I'm humbled by your presence, Baba. Uh, thank you for joining me. Um, you know what I'm saying? Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm humbled. I'm humbled. <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much, my brother. Uh, I'm humbled uh, myself for being here with you, and I, I do appreciate your presentation. Uh, unfortunately, I didn't get the whole thing because I had issues um, getting into the room. But uh, what I did here... Um, it has inspired me to do some work uh, coming uh, towards um, making the UNIA ACL uh, more relevant when it comes to the arts, uh, especially in my area. You know, um, we, it, it's, we, we do attend a lot of programs and we do sometimes have our program uh, in our rooms here in Washington, D.C. Um, mainly, uh, we, there, there's a group called... Um, uh, evergreen productions and and uh, that evergreen production we do poetry and, and drama uh, it, it's affiliated with us um, in, in a way it's what we call our our uh, our house band mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> and so um, we do we do that kind of work and we we, uh, we have some of the artists in there they, they've written their own stuff uh, they've got books and they, they do uh, performance poetry uh, by themselves uh, and on our places. But yes, I, I, I do agree with you. It's necessary for us uh, uh, as an organization to, to be affiliated or, or, or have an affinity for the arts mm -hmm. because uh, it, it, as, as history has shown during the period when Gar Marcus Garvey was alive in the early period of, of the UNIA, that art, is, and, and art was very important in, in projecting the, the, the message and the mission to the people. Yes, sir. Uh, and as, as we can see, um, it was copied by others. And, and then when you, you hear about this Harlem Renaissance, and we know exa exactly what that came from, um, it, 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 it was in, in an effort uh, to, to, to counter the Garvey movement's uh, affiliation with the arts of the, of the people in that area. So yes, uh, I do agree. And, and um, I hopefully that uh, when you ask the question, what is the modern UNIA ACL? membership or, or or organization doing i i do hope um we can be inspired yes sir to come forward and and do some more work thank you very much barring this uh covid and all that um it, it's gonna be a job <laughs> yes, but um i think we can work towards uh 
making it better. Thank you very much, Baba. Thank you for being uh, in that room, my brother. And uh, I, I, I'm happy that I have been able to join you and the rest of the folks um, with, with this presentation. Thank you, Baba. I know, I know it's half past the hour now, so um, people are going to want to go back into the other room. I just want to say, um, once again, I, I mean, I, I looked at the lineup, um, people that I'm presenting alongside right now, um, and I'd, I'd love to be in another session right now. Uh, so I, I, I'm truly humbled by, by people coming through and joining me um, in, in this presentation right here. I do, I, I do really appreciate it. And, um, and what I'll try to do is send the clip of the, of the, of the, um, of the play so that people can watch it. Um, you know, um, in the chat. So in, in the chat for the, um, the, the plenary, I'll, I'll share the clip and people can watch it in their own time, um, you know, when you get a chance, all right? Thank you very all much. All right. Thank, thank, thank you. you. Thank you very much. That's in that. So don't worry. Okay. Lives. All right. Lives. And I know that when we go forward with some of these solutions, to some they may be extreme or uncomfortable. But our condition is very extreme and even more uncomfortable. And as we go forward, we understand we may find obstacles. And those obstacles may come from people who look like me. And those obstacles may not. Man in sixth row, four from the left. Constantly pushes his left hand into his grey suited double breast. Each time increasing the intake and pace of breath. Chakra could be a threat. Sister, in the 27th row, slowly passes Atom to Bro on the right, while brother two seats to the left behind is guided to his seat, appearing to be blind. Convincing? Keep watch, not to mind. See, we're trained to expect the unexpected. Right. Forensic detail deployed to people's positioning. Intentive listening and rapid eye maneuvering. Trained to watch all of this. Summarize all of this. Even that sister who wants a hug and kiss could be on my uh, fret list. I analyze situations in detail acute and minute on any scale for me to fail or constitute a criminal attribute. For I have a role in this plight, requiring exceptional vision in and foresight. I view actions and patterns and patterns of actions and calculate like a sum to predict outcome. We, pre we precision, mathematical and scientific. The cap is worn by whoever would fit it, and woe be to thee who would draw for that part. For if you seize too hard, I see through the facade and clock all with whom you've parred. See, they're all connected by intrinsic strings. Interwoven deep, 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 deep into psyches. You mean like that mental side, bro? Yeah, it just might be. Or maybe the characterization of a black panther. Watching, aware of everything peaceful, but when attacked will devour. Trusting of no one. For this life could be quite lonesome as the bodyguard of this chosen one. Or one who's chosen to play his position. So now I reside on that middle ground between trust and suspicion. Constantly making life-dependent decisions in a split second. The ideal to protect and the necessity to hold suspect exist in the same place against those who feel the need to ensure that those who would lead meet a deadly fate. But what we could provide and create ensure that lessons of history are learned from and not repeated unnecessarily. Because the hearts of too many are contaminated with a seed of bad mind, envy and jealousy. While others are selfishly caught upon this illusion that this system can provide them a better solution and end up victims of a payroll. But while they sell they souls, we remain unblind and we see the hands of those who pull the strings and know exactly where they infiltrate our teams. And as a result of these zombies and walking deads, we receive death threats on the regs. See, late night calls from withheld anonymous only serve to increase the autonomous mind state governed from being in the trenches. Say that again, bro. All right, well, in, in, in other words, the fact that I receive daily death threats only strength from my resolve. For from these experiences of new and old, those well known and those untold, the truth shall one day evolve, and God's chosen people shall stand upright and bold.
Right. So we're told. But when they decide to stand upright and bold and shake that devil from off their backs, that devil that takes that free ride across rough and turbulent tides, see, simply standing upright will cause these free riders to support themselves. And as like before in their industrial revolution, <laughs> their covers will be bare. Yeah, like old Mother Hubbard shells. See, we've already had multiple assassination attempts on prison to be God Tuckstar. From poison foods to man-made diseases. From character assassination to organization infiltration. I'm telling you people, these attacks never ceases. But what increases the growth and awareness of this elite team of revolutionary activists? Pan African Congress. But what, Greek, what increases is the growth and awareness of this elite team of revolutionary activists? All African people. Growth and awareness of the elite team of revolutionary activists. Pan African youth organization. Revolutionary activists. Nation of Islam. Racial liberty activists. Our revivalists. Who want more? Who want more than just this black power fist? Resist the temptation to dismiss this, for ignorance most definitely is not bliss. So now these teams look to enlist and recruit more soldiers in army fatigues and boots so we can build more organizational groups and defend our fruits. Like President Tugstar, who some say has been sent from Ja, Ra, Allah, it no matter! Sent to bring back and realign that black star. So let that black star shine and those involved know their role and stay in line. For the roles of those who come against us are well and clearly defined. COINTELPRO is not the past, nor it is a myth. So while we fight and resist, they will send their silent and slick agents within our midst. Who intel report back, spread confusion, deceive and spy. And watch if you lie, yes, watch if you lie for sex. Mercenary means that even your partner may not be all that sincere and true. Especially if they do not look like you. All agents are paid, but the effect is still the same, with egotistical mavericks and loose cannons in the game. So even disrespect can be a threat, the effect of which is only subject to how low they're prepared to go and to what effect. But my role is to protect, and I hold no regrets, for if freedom is the goal, even my last breath is no object. See, I'll stake my life for this, for this is my life, and my life is this. See, some say, some say, why do you risk your life to save this man? And I say, I risk my life to save this man for his, this man is risking his, save mine. And we, and we are, and we are, and we are so deficient of time. We are so deficient of time. We are no, so... Bro. It's no time to repeat that line. Because we are so deficient of time. Yeah. Find your duty in life, for I've already found mine. This burden carry of this ancestral bloodline. Genetic, kinetic history flows in this temple of God, never far from the overstanding standing of that which is greater than mankind. See, I truly am my brother's keeper and will defend his honor until the end of time. Until which time I will be redeployed to the source and work again for the divine. So if none else, if none else, I will be that one. Dedicated with dedication to this dedicated one. Forget running for election, this is the stance for freedom, a start to resurrect and get lifted higher. So for those who wish to stop the rise of this black messiah, try. But you're, you're gonna, gonna have, have to come, come through me first. first. Yeah. Yeah.